Welcome to Whiskey Lore, the interviews. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, the Amazon bestselling author of Whiskey Lore's Travel Guide to Experience in Kentucky Bourbon. And today I've got the honor of welcoming in Joe Baker of Old Smoky, a man whose choice of occupation in 2009 probably caught some people off guard going from criminal attorney to moonshiner. Um, I've talked to a, a lot of people on the forefront of the Tennessee whiskey boom, and what's interesting is that Old Smoky was really right there at the very beginning and one of the ones that made the most impactful of splashes uh, with this new Tennessee distilling movement. And uh, when you set up near America's most visited national park, you're going to have a good chance at success. So we're going to talk a lot about uh, the rise of Old Smoky and also dive into a whiskey that they just released last year. It is called James Ownby Reserve Tennessee Straight Bourbon Whiskey. And it not only has some family ties uh, in that name, but there's also some historical ties as well. So we will jump into that as well. So uh, welcome to the show, Joe. Glad to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm a big fan and, and glad to, to finally be able to, to be a part of it. So thank you. Yeah. Well, this the thing about me doing research and trying to learn more about the beginnings of Tennessee's distilling movement. Of course, we had Jack and George, and then Phil Pritchard came in. And so for a while, it was just three distilleries in the state. And then all of a sudden, laws changed in 2009, and boom, we have, you know, 40-plus distilleries in, in Tennessee now. And so you were actually right there at the beginning of this what what kind of drew you in to this idea of opening a distillery yeah you know it's it's funny i i was uh i've, I've had some good fortune in my life and and uh, probably uh one of one of the the biggest pieces of good fortune was was uh, being raised in sevier county tennessee as you said that sevier county's uh, right there at the uh, at the national park entrance and and we are uh the beneficiaries of, of a lot of traffic and, and tourism as a result. I, I grew up um, as, a, as a child in East Tennessee that, that was, you know, I guess part of a, a, a long history of families that, that had settled in the area. My, my uh, first ancestors were, were in the area in the late 1700s. And uh, so I think I was born into um, you know that that mountain heritage in a in a real lucky way, and although I picked up pieces of um, of that uh, distilling heritage throughout my life, I never I never expected to to get into the business. It was it was not something that uh, as a uh, as a kid or or through college and and even uh, my early professional life while I was practicing law, I never I never imagined that uh, that this would be my my uh, my livelihood. And uh, lo and behold, things started to change in, in 2009 that, uh, that, that led us down this path. So, um, yeah, I was kind of born into it. So when, when people ask me, how'd you get into it? I, I think that my, my dad, when I was young, would, uh, would take me with him to, uh, to cook mash. And, and uh, I never ran a still. I was never, uh, my, my, my expertise was uh, holding a big hose, a fire hose, and recirculating mm -hmm. mash in a, in a, uh, a, large, a large pot. And uh, and quite frankly, I I, uh, I believe that uh, whatever they were making was was being sold to uh, cosmetic companies or, or food companies as an ad as an additive or, or an ingredient. I, I think that uh, uh, I remember uh, being told that uh, I think it was vanilla extract that, that was needed. There was alcohol and, and vanilla extract, and we were making, yeah. we were making it and selling it for that purpose. <laughs> It's right. it, it, you, you, uh, you never know, you know, and, and you always believe your, your parents, but, uh, I'm not sure my dad was leading me, uh, exactly. <laughs> but that yeah. was my, that was my, I guess my, my entry into, uh, distilling. And, and so, uh, as a, as an attorney in, in 2009, I, I was, I enjoy being a lawyer. I, I'm, I still, uh, really look forward to, to, uh, working with individuals and, and, and fighting for individual freedoms as an attorney. But my, um, my heart was, was looking for a, a change. I wanted to do something different. I think tourism was, was in my blood just because we, you, know, you grow up around it, as I said, in, in Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg. And, and so, um, there was a, a bill that was kind of creeping through the state legislature and, uh, I was 
really just watching it from afar. I had no involvement in it uh, at the time. Uh, I was just a casual observer. And uh, as, I, as I saw this, uh, I, I thought, well, you know, it, it sure would be a, uh, a heck of a souvenir to be able to, to sell in the mountains uh, when people come to visit East Tennessee, to be able to, to, uh, to put moonshine in a jar and, and give them, you know, a genuine and authentic piece of, of, uh, of our mountain heritage as a souvenir. And so that, that's really where, that's where things started for me, was just uh, seeing the opportunity um, uh, percolate as, as our uh, legislature was, was considering the, the change in the law. Yeah, and it's interesting when I talked to your uncle, uh, Johnny Baker, uh, he took me on a tour through the Nashville facility, and we were chatting about things, and I feel like I'm just talking to you know somebody that I grew up around because I grew up in Asheville, North Carolina, on the other side of the Smoky yeah. Mountains. Yeah. And so it was a tourist area, and so you were used to having an influx of people uh, in the area, but then you were also kind of used to that mountain culture all around you as well. And I'm sure, you know, you with a, a family involved in it, I'm from Michigan originally, but we moved down here when I was really young. And so I would hear the stories about the moonshiners up in the hills. And I mean, there were plenty of tall tales out there. I'm sure you got plenty of those tall tales, maybe even through your own family tree. Yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> Without a doubt. I, yeah. So I've been told that uh, anytime there's moonshine around, tall tales are, are also part of it. So I, I think that uh, without a doubt, you've got you've got plenty. Yeah. So uh, so we'll get to dive a little bit more into that too. But we we're talking yeah. about you know they moved from three counties to 41 counties, uh, opening this up. And so wh why do you feel that the state of Tennessee was was ready to open it up like that because it did, it seems like they did that and maybe there were distillers who were interested in getting into it but it sounds like everything kind of passed by the time you said okay let's jump in yeah I, I was watching it I, I remember um, a lot of the debate and and uh, and I think the the impetus for the for the bill that uh, that finally worked its way through the legislature and became law was uh, uh, the financial situation I, I think across the country in uh, 08 09, there was uh, there was certainly some uh, some negative pressure across the, the country. Uh, we, we had uh, dealt with the, the housing crisis, and and uh, it was it was it was a difficult time for for a lot of families. And uh, the state of Tennessee was looking for um, different means of revenue, and this was uh, an opportunity to create industry that uh, that had a long and storied history in in Tennessee. And uh, to do it in a way that, that could create jobs, that could create tax revenue, and create opportunity for a lot of people, and and we were we were certainly beneficiaries of that. I I, I applaud uh, our uh, our House and Senate and the, and the governor's office at the time for for making it happen because now, as you say, there's uh, there's um, quite a few distilleries that uh, that have that have uh, uh, popped up around the state. The number of jobs that are created, you know, just in our our business, uh, we, I think we we're, we're employing close to a thousand people. So you can you can see the the impact of, of that legislation is um, is significant, and, and uh, there are a lot of families that that have been positively impacted by it. Well, I think the other thing too is that Tennessee is such an agricultural state, so it just makes sense to me that that would be a direction use for your own corn. Yeah. Really. Oh, for sure. It's, it's, you know, I, I think that certainly supporting the, uh, um, the agricultural community, the farmers, the, the, the people who are really working the land. I mean, it, it, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? I, I think the, uh, uh, the reality is we are, um, the state of Tennessee exports, uh, a, a lot of great products, uh, none of which are, are any more significant than music and, and whiskey. I, I think that, uh, we've, um, yeah, we, we're, we're, um, really blessed to, to have both of those industries and, and our uh, uh, legislature and the governor at the time, they, they were quite wise, I think, to, to really uh, open up opportunities for us to, to explore and to celebrate that history of whiskey making, spirits making in, in the state of Tennessee. Yeah. So it seems that if you're going to start a business like this, you, you probably have an idea that you're either wanting it to be a tourist destination thing or you want it to be the moonshine 
right. was the original kind of idea? Was it more the tourist side of things? You know, I, I think that um, I was, uh, my wife and I, we, we're both attorneys, and we had, at the, in 2009, we have, um, we had just had our third child, and we were at a point where we were certainly fortunate and blessed in, in our lives and, and doing just fine working as lawyers, but um, we, we were, I was working really hard. I was working a lot of hours, and, and I, I wanted to do something different. So I, I think that the, uh, the push to, to, uh, uh, to work for a, a better financial future for my family was, was certainly, the, the, uh, I think, what was, what, what was prompting me to, to do this. So I think first, first and foremost, I just wanted to open a business that didn't lose money, right? So I, I think <laughs> that, that, was, uh, that was the starting point. And, and I, I think equally, not losing money, trying to, trying to actually create a business that, uh, that, that led to value, but also uh, uh, equally for me, I, I think um, creating a product that was authentic, something that was genuine, that uh, my friends and family at home wouldn't look at me and, and uh, laugh because it was uh, it, it wasn't real. I think that that so you know I, there's so so many times, especially early on, I, I I would hear well that's that's not real moonshine, and and I think that yeah there's there is fair criticism that uh, that it is different because we pay taxes on it, but but right. it's but it's not fair. It's not <laughs> fair to, to criticize it and say it's not real because it, it doesn't taste the same or or that it it's you know it, it is uh, in any way different as a product because. It's the same, it, you know. It, 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 what we make is exactly the same. It may be a little, a little more refined and, and more consistent of a product and, and safer, but uh, the, the reality is, what we make is 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 the it's it is it tastes like and is moonshine, and it's what what's been made in the hills of, of East Tennessee for a long time. So I, I think creating a product that was authentic was was high on my list, and and, and you know I, at that time I was new to the industry. I, I had um, um, no um, legitimate industry experience in, in beverage. And, and so, uh, there were conversations, uh, at home about, uh, the product and, and what it was going to look like. And you know, I had no idea what label regulations, uh, existed. I, I thought, let's just put it in a jar and, and whatever the, the very minimum label is, let's, let's do that. So I, I think that a lot of times it's fun to, to, uh, be complimented on, the, the package design and, and the label design that, that we uh, that we we finally came up with, but the reality was, um, you know, it, it was it was not there wasn't a lot of choice to it. It was it was obvious. Let's just use the jar and, and put as little on the on the product as possible. But I think that simplicity and the uh, the authenticity that came with it uh, really served us well. Yeah, I heard you uh, had a little issue with the mason jars at first that they were not quite in, in a large enough supply for what you needed. Yeah, you know, we, we had uh, to, to say that we had issues with the jar is an understatement. I, I think that, uh, I don't know that, that um, you know, I've, I've gone through a lot of tough things in, in life. You know, there's challenges every day. We're facing a lot of challenges and, and this business uh, has grown uh, so significantly and, and we've, we're, we're so incredibly fortunate to, to, to have been a part of it. But the, the reality is it was hard. And in those early days, um, you know, we, we, we did, we, it was like we were scratching and clawing everywhere we could to, to get jars that, that would fit. And, and again, out of, out of ignorance, you know, I, I, I just early, very early, I didn't understand why we couldn't just go to Walmart and pick up some more ball jars and, and, uh, you know, jar them. And, and it was, yeah. it, you know, the, the, uh, certainly, you know, the, as, as we grew, even as an attorney, you know, I, I think uh, growing to understand um, the regulations and, and just, you know, how, uh, heavily sp regulated and specific the industry is it, it's, uh, and for good reason. Um, yeah, we, we, we learned a lot, but, but yeah, the, the, uh, getting glass in those early days, um, we, we, we were, we were unsophisticated to say the least. We figured. Yeah. <laughs> so give us a picture of how the distilling started. What, I mean, did you, hire in a distiller to come in and uh you know kind of help choose what kind of equipment you needed and what or or did you have family members that were like yes we've you know been doing this yeah. you know illegally for <laughs> so uh, we we can kind of tell you from our history what what yeah. you can do it was a, it was a combination of both uh we we had uh family that uh and friends that uh that uh made stills uh that uh that that made 
plenty of liquor and, and uh, had, had perspective to offer. I, have, uh, I still have the, the conference table in my, uh, in my law office in, in Sevierville. We, we, uh, I remember Uncle Johnny, who you mentioned earlier, and, and uh, my partners and, and uh, a couple other family members sitting around this conference table in, in Sevierville. And we had, I think we had probably 12 to maybe 12 to 15 different um, uh, moonshines that, uh, that we, were, we were sampling and, and just talking about, you know, trying to, to compare and contrast the recipes and, and all the, the different nuances of each one. And my, uh, by the time we left that night, the, the varnish was, was worn off the, the conference table wow. and, uh, in, in a lot of places. And, and so uh, now I, I look at that table and I'm, I'm fond of the memory, but it was, uh, I was, I was, uh, I was a little upset by it that night, but it, yeah, the, the, um, the evolution, you asked about the distilling, it, it came from initially that, you know, we, we started talking just uh, locally amongst uh, friends and family and trying to figure out what we wanted it to be. But ultimately, because this was a, um, you know, a, again, it was a new thing. We, we were getting the first license in the state of Tennessee uh, under this new law. We were working with ABC. Not only were we dealing with um, city, a city that had never licensed a, a distillery location in a state that was was working under a new law, but you know we, we then also had to to uh, to comply with all the the federal licensing requirements. So, in order to do that, we um, we ended up hiring uh, Dave Pickrell, who uh, a lot of people in the industry are familiar with. He he helped a, a lot of people get uh, uh, get their start. I, I think he. Um, um, he was instrumental, without a doubt, in, in giving us good direction. And, and then uh, uh, Rob Sherman at uh, uh, Vendome Copper uh, was was also somebody who who was really a, a friend early on. And and so we um, you know, we we set up a small still. And uh, you know, I, I I don't know how much you you, you want to get into it, but my uh, the the reality there at, during that time was that we. We were underfunded. We didn't have uh, a lot of money to, to start a distillery, mm-hmm. and the the law required that we secure the property and we secure all this equipment and we go through the investment stages all before we could even apply for the license. And it, it was uh, it was stressful to say the least. There, there were uh, uh, difficulties in in getting financing. I ended up uh, using my my law office building. I was able to to secure a, a pretty modest loan. Uh, as a uh, um, a means by which we were able to fund this, but it was uh, it was difficult, and, and the stress levels were high. And so, uh, uh, Dave Pickrell helped with the with the initial uh, phases of of the distilling and setting up the equipment. We got that set up, and we applied for our licenses. And um, you know, the this all happened in a in a, a matter of maybe eight months. So we, yeah. we were we were quick. You know, as soon as as soon as the law uh, came into effect, we were we were working on this, and and uh, we got licensed in uh, I think it was May. It was either May or June of, of 2010, and um, it was uh, it was an adventure for sure. But that's that's kind of how the the early the earliest days evolved. It's it's such an interesting industry because you have to first get set up. If you're a distiller, you have to first know how to distill before you can go get your license. So right. it's kind of like you're, you, there's a risk to that, I guess, what happens if you don't end up getting the, the license, but uh, you're, you're hopefully feeling self-assured that you can get through all of that red yeah. tape that that, that yeah. is just being created at that very moment. So yeah. No, for sure. And I, I think that you know, there, there are, now it, looking back, I, I think there are, there are probably opportunities to uh, to get a license without uh, without distilling the the products and and creating a brand without distilling products, but it was uh, for us we had we had two uh, two fermenters and a and a uh, a nice little pot still to start and and we you know, that's that is exactly that's how we did it and and it was uh, it was fun because it was in a uh, um, it was in a building. We we were in a building. We started in a building about two thousand square feet, maybe twenty twenty five hundred square feet, that was um, off the Parkway in Gatlinburg, and um, it was it was in I believe it was in foreclosure. And otherwise, we I, we couldn't have afforded the rent. So we we got a we got a really good deal on on the space because it was a, a distressed property, and 
we we made the best of it, and, and it's funny now that that space, of course, has grown, and uh, it's it is the most visit, visited distillery in the world. So it's 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 crazy how how that all came about. But yeah, uh, we're, we're we're certainly we love we love our our visitors. So when you did get started on this, and you got Dave Pickerel there, and uh, you're kind of figuring out from the recipes that that you've got your hands on. Did, were you aware of anybody else outside the state of Tennessee that was selling legal m- moonshine? You know, I, I there were I, I definitely remember uh, the brand Georgia Moon and and then also Midnight Moon, and Midnight Moon was um, it was a, a brand that I, I really I, I was always a NASCAR fan growing up, so Junior Johnson and his history mm. was uh, was was something that that I was I was uh, uh, very aware of and. I didn't understand. I think at that time they were selling their products in a bottle. They weren't. They weren't selling in a jar. And and so I, I think that uh, they were certainly celebrating the moonshine history and heritage. But but I, I think they were they were uh, uh, also you know bringing a product to market that was maybe a, a, a little bit more mainstream because it was in a bottle. And the Georgia Moon I believe was in a, a jar. Um, so yeah, there were. I was I was aware of those. And and there may have been others. But that uh, those were two that I I remember. Um, they were making products. I don't remember. Um, yeah, the flavors were something that that were uh, uh, I think innovative that we brought to the market that were important. Uh, we were we were you know to start we just did the the clear uh, products, but uh, but quickly we we rolled out apple pie and blackberry and and now we we've, we've got so many flavors that it's, it's hard to keep <laughs> up. But uh, but those uh, yeah that that was. Apple pie was was what I was uh, most familiar with as a as a fan of moonshine outside of before Old Smoky. It was you know, apple pie has always been a, a fan favorite. You know, we we were uh, um, especially birthdays and Christmas parties that kind of stuff. It was uh, I, I was always excited to to uh, to have have apple pie around. Yeah, when I first started talking to to Johnny Baker, I, I said, you know, um, I do a whiskey podcast. And whiskey people, you know, are, I, I don't want to say they're got their noses in the air or anything, but there is kind of this feeling like when you see a lot of product that is, is flavored, that maybe the spirit behind it isn't, uh, isn't the highest of quality. And you'll hear that on and off, but then you start mentioning, you know, Dave Pickerel is, is in here, uh, you know, helping you get this all set, which, I mean, I can't tell you how many distilleries I've been to that he's had an influence on that are making amazing spirits. And the fun part was that when I was in Nashville, uh, you know, Johnny let me taste this experimental whiskey i guess it was a first batch of something that uh that you guys were distilling there that was a it had no corn in it it was a red wheat and rye whiskey that was in a 15 gallon barrel that had aged for seven months and that was amazing yeah uh i was like why isn't somebody making something like yeah. this no it, uh, that's that is I know, I know what you're talking it had to have some corn in it but but i think that that uh it, it was um we're we're doing some fun things with whiskey, and I'm I am over the moon excited about you know what uh, what we're doing there. But but I, I get your point. I, I think that it is it's it's easy for um, for people to to be real selective, let's say, in in what they drink and and how they approach that. I, I think that I uh, yeah I, I'm a I'm a, a wine drinker. I, I like big cabs, and and you know, I, I have this. It, it, you de- you develop sort of a, a profile and a, 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 a preference for for things, and so I I think that you know I'm not a big uh, I'm not a big drinker of flavored things. That's not my you know it's that's even even our products. I I, I am uh, I'm I am a fan of the apple pie. It, it's but I, the the uh, I do drink if I'm if I'm drinking spirits, I'm drinking a an unflavored product. I mean that, that's you know, so I, I I get it. Um, it doesn't mean it's it's right or wrong, right? Right. I, I think right. that's the, the reality. Is there are a lot of people that are enjoying flavored products, and and uh, you know, I, I'm my my, uh, uh, my preferences are no better than than his or her. So I, I I get it. I think it it is it's interesting, and I think for a brand, you know, this this level of seriousness. Are you serious? You know, is is it a serious whiskey? Um, if if it's flavored. Yeah, you know, to me, I, I think it's you're you're opening up opportunities for people to to explore and and uh, be introduced to to uh, to different types of spirits. So I think there's a lot of room for the flavors. But uh, but you know, for us, 
it is important that, that our base be uh, very, um, very high quality and, and you know, whether you're talking about a, a neutral spirit that, that we distill and, and we add to a flavor or a, uh, a corn-based product that, that, that's, you know, a corn and whiskey or, or specifically if you look at our, our, uh, our Blue Flame or, or the, the 153, there are a lot of products that, that we put out there that we take a whole lot of pride in the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the whiskey, the, the spirit that we're making and, and uh, it's, uh, you know, to each his or her own, but we, we love all people and, and excited to serve, you know, serve them all. Yeah. Well, we live in a, an age where people are now starting to move from just drinking whiskey neat to appreciating cocktails again. Right. And so right. we're going to, if we're adding in the ingredients into a cocktail, it only makes sense that if you're adding in flavor into, it's just an easy, easy cocktail for you. You don't yeah. have to go through all the trouble of uh, sourcing things. No, I, I think it is, and, and you know, it, it's it's a it's fun. You know, I think tasting different things that's that's just that's that's part of uh, I, I think part of part of the fun of spirits. And and uh, although I don't drink a lot of uh, uh, flavored uh, flavored spirits, I, we uh, we made the salty caramel that we uh, that we sell. That was uh, that was made first in my my mother in law's kitchen. And uh, we were just messing around with with uh, with ingredients in the kitchen one night, and, and I, my my uh, my brother-in-law and I were were making caramel, and we would mix in some bourbon and just taste it, and and so it, it's and it's terrific, you know, it's a great yeah. it's a great product. It's not a uh, it's not something that that uh, I necessarily drink a lot of, but I I enjoy I really enjoy the flavor, and and it's uh, it's it's fun. I, I was. Uh, I think I was inspired by an ice cream. I tasted salty caramel ice cream at some point. Mm. That's what got me thinking about it. But but you know there's 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 a lot of room for cocktails and and flavored products. And yeah, I think you're right. You just we're making it easy for the consumer if you're if you're if you're working on that and exploring flavors. And and uh, there's a lot of good ideas that are coming out of that uh, innovation. Well, and that's one of the things that I'm starting to get into at home is actually blending different whiskeys together and right. experimenting. It would yeah. be very interesting to experiment with a flavored moonshine and see, you know, how you could. You're basically mixing a cocktail, but you're doing it with, uh, with, with two um, spirits rather than, yeah. you know, two heavier spirits rather than yeah. doing it with. Um, and I, it wasn't long ago, actually. You, as soon as I saw salty caramel, I, I went, hmm, because I, I just had a scotch. That is a that has a salted caramel kind of a, a flavor to it, and I'm like, wow, that's really good in a spirit, and it's not something that I normally would put together, especially in a scotch, because we don't think yeah. of uh, you know caramel notes in in scotch as much as we do in bourbons, but yeah, um, yeah seems like there could be some uh, some compliments there, and in, in trying to blend those together. Yeah, no, for sure. It's you know, I, I think that uh, when when we were on. Um, um, you know, outdoor trips, guys trips that we've done skiing or whatever. It, it, it's, uh, it's funny how much I enjoy the flavors of chocolate chip cookies and a bourbon neat, you know? And, and mm. so it's, uh, I, I think the, the complimentary, uh, um, the compl complimentary, uh, notes of, of the cookie and the, and the bourbon are, to me are, are, are interesting. And I, I think there's, there are ways to do that in, in products too. It's, you know, it, it's, and it's not going to be necessarily the most sophisticated spirit that you've ever come across. And, and, you know, it's not going to, you're not going to, uh, write about it for, for days on, on blogs about, uh, about bourbon, but it's, it's they, these, these things, they, they're important. And, and I think that it's, it's a, um, it's a fun part of the, the industry that, uh, that we sure enjoy celebrating. Yeah. So the one that I had, I was at the uh, at the barn not too long ago. Uh, that was the only location of yours I hadn't been to, and so uh, in Pigeon Forge. And I went in and I said, "Okay, I'll do a tasting." And uh, they gave me some blueberry pancake, and, <laughs> and I, I have to tell you that when I tasted that blueberry pancake, I went, "This is amazing!" Because if if you if you'd have taken a blueberry pancake with maple syrup on it and stuck it in your mouth and then stuck that in your mouth it, you know it 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 was almost identical to me it was amazing how close you you 
got that flavor. Is there is there like this uh, this challenge that you guys have in trying to really nail those flavors down to an exact science? Yeah, it, we, we do have uh, we've got a good team, and, and the process is uh, it, it's it is really you know I, I'm uh, I'm blown away by the flavors that are created out of there, and, and I have. Uh, this is one that the, the cream is, it, it's a, it was a cream product, right? The blueberry pancake that you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, um, there's a guy that, uh, named Matt Lane that, uh, I played football with in high school and in Gatlinburg. And he's, he is, he's in charge of, uh, of that innovation on the, on the flavor side. And, and so we, um, we're fortunate to have him leading the charge there and, and, uh, but, but the process, it's funny, when we first started with flavors, you know, our, our process was a little less sophisticated. We'd start in the kitchen just mixing up some, you know, ap- different apple pie recipes, and, and, uh, and then you know, we'd taste it around, share it around with friends and family and see what everybody thought. Now we, we do have a, you know, a, a very formal tasting process where the team's coming in, a, a large team's coming in and, and doing tasting and blind tasting, and, and just over and over again, we're, we're really – we get to uh, we get through several rounds of tasting before we we actually put a product out for trial mm. and so yeah it's there's a lot of thought that goes into it I'm I'm yeah you know, I, I gotta I gotta tell you I have before this I'd never heard of blueberry pancake moonshine but I I'm, <laughs> I'm and I'm I'm not there, there's some of these products that uh, that make me uh, they make me question you know it, it is as uh, as much as I really do um, care about the authenticity of the brand it's uh, there are there are places like this where fun overrules and and so they're they're making some fun products that uh, that I, I think uh, some 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 of the old heads from from uh, my hometown might be rolling over in their graves. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are are really screwing this up, but it, it is fine. They're having a good time with it. Yeah, and I, the creams. I, go, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say the creams. You know, I, I am uh, my. When, when we talk about the spirits industry, before I before I ever thought about Old Smoky, I did have a uh, an, an incredible and do have an incredible eggnog recipe that I would share around the courthouse uh, before Christmas, and so that recipe evolved into our, our shine nog, which was one of the first creams that we we put out, and so. Uh, I, I think that uh, there's so the creams have a little bit of a, a story, you know, as it, as it goes back to to that uh, that time around Christmas and, and eggnog. But these uh, th- these new flavors, they're they're popular. Hmm. The butter pecan, I, I think the butter pecan is, uh, is is right now one of the best sellers we have. So it's it's always fun to see what's next. Very nice. So one of your neighbors, uh, Daryl Miller, over at uh, Bootleggers. Uh, he was telling me some moonshiner stories. He said, I get moonshiners that come out of the hills and they want me to test their, uh, their moonshine. And he said, one guy came in and he said, I have some 220 proof moonshine. Wow. And he's wow. going, okay, that, that's like somebody giving 110%. I, I don't know yep. if that's exactly quite <laughs> feasible. Yeah. Um, have you did you have a lot of that when you guys first started out that moonshiners yeah. were coming in going hey you know uh, my stuff's a lot stouter than yours and test this out we hear that you know it's it's we we actually i remember uh, i remember one story and i'm i'm, I'm not going to get this exactly right but there was somebody that had uh, brought in some apple pie moonshine and and they were uh, um they were challenges challenging us a little bit on on apple pie and and they thought that apple pie needed to be it was it, it, their apple pie was, I can't remember what they said, 120 proof or some, you know, it, it was a really high proof product in their mind. And, uh, we, we proofed it just to, to see, you know, where it was. And, and it was, it was maybe, maybe in the thirties. I mean, it was really, really good. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, it, but I, I think that it's, you know, people are, uh, there, there are a lot of stories out there and the reality is, and, and, and was then that, uh, when when there was a lot of uh, moonshine that was that was pushing through the system illegally, it, it was uh, it made sense to cut it as much as you could because the you know the alcohol was was that, that's what was most expensive to make, and so if you could mix uh, some other flavors or even if it was just watered down, if it was a water you know if it's just a, a clear product, it, it wasn't there was not a uh, 
I don't think there was any incentive to make it as high proof as you could. I think that the, yeah. the, in, the incentive was probably to, to, to try to proof it down more, but it's fun. I, I love those stories and, and, you know, I grew up around them and, and now to be able to, to, um, to share them in a way that, uh, people finally, you know, in, in our, uh, where we make most of our product in Sevier County and in Cock County, um, I, I think there's a, a real, uh, respect that, that, that has evolved over the last 12 years because we do, uh, we have so many team members that are that are from the area and and that are uh, you know legacy of they they are they're serving the legacy of of their uncles and granddads and we, you know, I, I think that so so I think we uh, we we finally because we do uh, distill all of our spirits I think that people are, have recognized that we're we're doing it the right way we're honoring a, a rich tradition and history and and so it's it's a uh, it's fun to it's fun to hear those stories though, and to be challenged every now and then. Yeah. I have I've, I have uh, I guess more more than anything else, I've probably heard oh I don't know a thousand times that uh, you know somebody will come up to me and say oh I've I've got uh, I've got a jar of of popcorn's last batch, and and uh, if if uh, if it's true, popcorn's last batch was so big that that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think yeah, that Brown Foreman and and everybody else would be challenged on, on volume, but it, it it is fun to hear. Um, it's fun to hear about you know people's uh, their, their uh, experience with moonshine and and uh, popcorn Sutton is certainly a a, a rich and real uh, genuine uh, piece of of our 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 local history and and somebody who has been celebrated. But but it's a story like that that I I just. I get a kick out of that. You mentioned Western North Carolina. He spent a lot of time over there, and, and I'm sure that. Uh, oh, I heard about him a lot when I was I'm there. Sure. I yeah. seem to I seem to know a lot of people who knew him, and I'm like, for a guy who's like hiding out in the woods, he's got a lot of people that know him. <laughs> well, I think, I, he I think he enjoyed visiting, and he was not shy to talk. So I, I think he it, it, those those are probably real. You know, I think a lot of people did did get to to spend some time around him. Yeah, there's a whole other culture, too, that I really didn't hear much about, but I've started to hear more about. I live in Greenville, South Carolina, so we're, we're down in what was called the dark corner. Right, uh, sure. You know, Remember, yeah, mo- moonshine mafia, I'm, you know, right. all of these kind of things that are a whole part of history that, you know, is, is I don't know if it's hidden. I just haven't quite dug into it yet. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's. I'm familiar with with that. I've heard of uh, Dark Corner, and and there was a. I know a distillery uh, opened under that name, in Greenville. Yeah, and, uh, it, it's. Uh, but it, you know, it, that's. I think that's the other part of moonshine that that I find uh, so interesting is that no matter where you go in the country or, or in either, even other parts of the world, there, there are these these uh, let's call them indigenous spirits that that are made. You know, they they develop in in these towns or, or in these communities, you know, all over the world that they have stories. And, and it, it is at, at its core, I think that, you know, no matter what they call it, it, it is, it's similar to, you know, moonshine for us. And, and while moonshine may be in Gatlinburg and, and you may have this dark corner of, uh, of, of the upstate of South Carolina or, or over in Maggie Valley, you know, there, all these places all over the country have these stories. So it's, it's fun to be, it's fun to be a part of that. Yeah. So in doing my research on Tennessee whiskey history, a lot of the distillers that were the first distillers in Tennessee didn't really come out of the Scots-Irish um, background, which was a surprise to me when we started talking about like Evan Shelby and uh, you know, Jack Daniel and, and you know, some of those those names. But in the mountains, you know, it, it was a different culture and it was the the families coming down uh from the ones that were leaving the ulster area of scotland or of ireland and and coming over this way and they kind of just made their way down through the mountains so with your own family how far back do you know about your family and what did you said 1700s when they came through here uh how how far can you kind of trace them back a a little bit farther back i I know that uh, my um I guess it's my my fifth great grandfather, and, and I, I I think I've got this right uh, uh, that the uh, the product that James Wanby is is named after. I think he's buried at Bat Cave actually over in in Western North Carolina. But the uh, um, the the family we 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 are 
I think they trickled in through Virginia and North Carolina and, and settled in, in Tennessee. But um, I've, I have uh, – my mom is, is the youngest of 15 kids, and uh, I've got a, a, an aunt and uncle on that side that, uh, that have traced things back to, to England, Ireland, and Scotland and, and you know, are, are very um, – yeah, they, they, they can point to a, a, a really – clear line and, and it's it's fun to see that I, I I don't know the answer to it right off the top of my head but but I I know that uh, those are our folks and and it's uh, you know it's it's I I'm excited someday to be able to to physically to go there and 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 trace that and kind of kind of see you know where where we came from but uh, you know it's it's one of the greatest parts of our our country is that we've we've got so many people from so many different parts of the world that come here and, and, you know, it, it makes us interesting, you know, that we, we've got all these, we don't, we, we've got this diverse history and, and past. And, and so, uh, our, ours is, is sort of, uh, specific to, to that area of the world, but it's, it's, uh, I it's certainly that's, that's, that's where we came from. Yeah. So we, in doing my research, what I didn't realize about the mountains of Tennessee was that that was actually set aside by the British government before it became the United States. It was set aside as land for the natives. So it had, you know, the Cherokee basically owned all of the Appalachian Mountains in what was then North Carolina uh, over. And so it was unsettled. uh, It was not allowed to be settled until around the... 17 i think it was 1770 when it finally opened up and uh, there was a treaty and they were able to come into the area and it wasn't long after that that the over mountain men which was the name for the uh, settlers that had uh, been the scots irish and the uh, and the english and the rest who had settled in your area of east tennessee went down and took part in the battle at King's Mountain and a lot of the other skirmishes that were going on and battles during the Revolutionary War. So if James Owenby is in your is, is your great five times uh, grandfather, he would have had to have been one of the first settlers in that area, uh, yeah. someone of a European uh, culture. Yeah, no, it, it's it's and and I I think that uh, you know to be able to to look at that and honor that in in our uh, uh, the bourbon that we put out, you know, I I have uh, my my mom, uh, her maiden name was OMB, and and uh, it's uh, it's fun to be able to 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 look back, reflect, and and honor honor uh, um, you know somebody that yeah I, I think that uh, he was. You know, I, I'm sure just a, a small part of that effort, but you know, just to be a part of that effort is, I, I think, a uh, uh, you know, really a, a significant thing. I, I was uh, fortunate to, to serve um, our, our country in the in the uh, in the military, and, and so it's a, for me, it's you know, to be able to honor that in some way. Um, it, I'm really proud to to have done that, and, and I I have not been to the to to the site where he's buried in Bat Cave. Uh, but but excited to make that trip. I've seen a lot of photographs, and and uh, it's a uh, you know it's 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 neat. I think there's a real Western North Carolina and East Tennessee, and and certainly the Smoky Mountain area. I, I think uh, no matter which side of the mountain you're you're on, um, you're if you're from one side or the other, you've probably got family on one side of the other <laughs> because, because the the people kind of move back and forth. And there, there are a lot of Wimbies over in in Western North Carolina that. Um, um, I, I, our, our distant cousins for, for, for our family that, uh, um, yeah, this, this is, it's, it's a fun, it, it really is a, a good thing to be able to celebrate as a, a, a history of someone, uh, that, that we have roots to that, uh, that, that served and, and was, was part of, of, uh, you know, creating, uh, what we, we now know as a, as a free country. Yeah. Well, in in doing the research on the on the over mountain men, of course, we hear about it. I don't live that far from Kings Mountain, so we get a lot of more information about it here. But um, the over mountain men. I mean, the whole thing was that uh, Patrick Ferguson was uh, a, a a Scotsman who was uh a expert rifleman in fact the story goes that at brandywine he had his rifle uh set to shoot at george washington on his horse and he he was an expert marksman so he wouldn't have missed 
but it was a gentlemanly, gentlemanly thing not to shoot the leader of the other uh, force. And so the war may have ended at that point, but then the, the turning point was that basically Nathan Nathaniel Green was down in South Carolina fighting these battles, and uh, the Overmountain men came down and were taking part in some of those battles. And there was a point where basically he sent back a prisoner of, of war back to North Carol or to uh, uh, that area and warned them that if the Overmountain men came back down, he would annihilate them. And that was enough to anger the uh the men uh you know uh john severe and uh uh you know the shelbys and the carters and all of them and they just said okay you know what we're coming down and we're going to take care of this and it was their victory at uh, the battle of king's mountain which turned the war and yeah. forced the british to back up and go to yorktown where where it really did come to right. uh, a conclusion so uh, it's it's hard to underestimate the um, impact that those settlers of East Tennessee had on the future of the United States. Right. No, it, it is. And I, I think that that tough mindedness, you know, this, this fierce um, independent spirit that, uh, that, that you find throughout the mountains, we, we're, uh, uh, I, I, I love to, I love to, um, I, I claim the, the moniker, the, the name Hillbilly. I, I claim that proudly. I, I, I think that we are, uh, we, we come from tough stock and, and, and people who have survived off the land. And, and, and certainly uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, I would never want to be put up against folks that, uh, that have had to, <laughs> to survive tough, tough life in the, in the, uh, you know, in, in those pioneering days and in, in the, the wilderness of, of those, of those mountains and, and, the, the, those wouldn't be the first people I would challenge to a fight. <laughs> so, I, I think um, you know it, it's uh, it, it's it, we, we're uh, we're proud. We're really proud of that heritage. Yeah, one of the uh, locations that I remember, and I think you guys were a part of, was the Davy Crockett Tennessee whiskey. Yes, yeah, that was my my wife was uh, that that was I think I, I'm not I'm not certain about this, but I think that she is she was the the first. Uh, that would have been the first distillery owned by a woman in uh, in Tennessee, and and she was uh, she was really she was proud of that. Uh, we, we were and, and she'd been very involved in in the business. And I, I'm uh, I was fortunate to marry a, a, a lady much smarter than me, and she's she's kept us going. So <laughs> um, yeah, that, but that is uh, that that was uh, that was her her uh, her brand. Uh, we I think that was started in maybe 20, 2011, 2012, and and. Uh, ultimately has uh, has become part of the old smoky business was that kind of the first attempt at whiskey or were you doing whiskey before then um we we were not selling anything aged before then i, I don't believe we started with a the charred moonshine is is something that, that was was a um you know favorite of mine and it was uh, it, that was probably our, our that was our first foray into to anything that was aged albeit uh, pretty pretty young stuff um but the the Davy Crockett lines that that was uh, that was the first effort you know, within our family as as far as a, a a product that was was offered for sale. Yeah, did you were you a fan of the Moonshiner show? You know, I gotta admit, I just I I've never watched a full episode of it. I've, I've seen <laughs> some clips, and uh, and we I I will I will say this: I was a fan. Uh, of the first year, the first year or two, maybe we we did uh, we did advertise on the show, and and uh, um, it was something that I, I think it I think it helped us uh, that that uh, those advertisements. So the Discovery Channel, you know, the, the ads we we paid for, I think somehow they 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 probably benefited us uh, along the way. And I'm a fan. I, I I'm a fan of. Um, anything that that, uh, that that celebrates the the culture and the you know the I guess the mystique around moonshine. I'm not sure that it, it's. Uh, I'm. I'm not sure it's the the, the exact representation that that, <laughs> that, that I would want to see. But it, yeah, but, you know, for, for for the the folks in my in my hometown and in the in, in that part of the country. But it, it's there's a place for it, and I, I'm 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 a fan. It, it's just not uh, you know it, it's uh, 
it, it is it is entertainment for I, sure. I have to say that as somebody who has been an attorney and is in the moonshine business and watching a show like that, I mean, my my dad used to he was a policeman and he used to watch all the cop series and and he would just sit there going, they couldn't <laughs> they couldn't do that. They they yeah. couldn't do that. And then you have these cameramen following these moonshiners around, and they're supposed to be, you know, hiding out. And you're right. thinking, wait a second. I'm sure there's a cameraman with a, a cell phone in his pocket that probably has a GPS on it. <laughs> I'm sure. I, you know, it, it's it's entertainment. I have met a lot of the people that, that are involved. They are, uh, there are some, some, some great personalities that, uh, that are involved in that. And there are some people in there that I, I know have, have been um, uh, involved in, in making spirits. And, and so I, I'm, uh, I'm glad they've done as well with it as, as they have. Yeah. Well, it, and it brings the name Moonshine out so that when somebody's coming to the mountains, it's on their mind. So it couldn't have hurt sales at all. Yeah. It, it's like I say, it's entertainment. I think it's been a, uh, uh, it's a good, uh, it's a, it's, it's good entertainment. I, 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 I I have, um, I was a, I was a JAG, uh, officer in, in the air force and I served in the, in the air national guard in Tennessee. And, and, uh, there was a show called JAG that, um, uh, that was, I think it was maybe in the late eighties, early nineties. And, and, uh, you know, for a while, every time that uh, somebody would ask me what, uh, what, what, what do you do in the, in the air force? And I would, I would tell them, you know, in their mind, it was the television show <laughs> which, which was, was very different, you know, than, yeah. than, Riding wheels and power of attorneys, you know, it was pretty boring, I guess, in some ways, what I, what I did. But I, I think the, uh, the show sensationalized it just a little bit. And, and this is, yeah, I, I think it's similar. It's TV, right? It's yeah. entertainment. Although I will say that uh, growing up, I, my first job was in radio. And WKRP in Cincinnati was not very far off from the way it actually is <laughs> yeah. in radio. Cool. Yeah, yeah I, I could see that. I'm, I'm sure it's... <laughs> I can see it. Yeah, we're not talking big corporate radio. We're talking those little hometown stations that are, yeah. uh, you know, living off a, a shoestring budget and and just trying to make it. And the DJs come in when they want to come in and uh, right. pick their own music out and do all that sort of stuff. So uh, I, have, I haven't seen that. Show. I haven't even thought about that show in years. And I have to, I have to show. <laughs> I, I love I love going back and, and pulling out uh, old shows uh, and showing my kids. You know what. You, I used to watch this, you know, it just, you know, it, it's, it's fun to get their perspective on, on things like that. Yeah. How big is old Smoky now? You have four locations. And so how, how many tourists are you, you seeing per year at these four locations? I think that we, um, I, I don't have an exact number. I know it was over 5 million last year. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a mind boggling number. It's uh it's big and, and it's, uh, you know, it, it really is a um, um, just a, a great honor to to be able to, to greet that many people and and to introduce them. I, I think you've you've been to our locations in in a it's definitely a, a fun homespun sort of sort of uh, experience, but it's it's genuine. You know, I, I think that our our effort was uh, was from the from the beginning was even though we are a, a distillery and we're making moonshine and whiskey, I, I wanted uh, when I opened. Old Smoky in 2010. I had three young children. I had a, a six, uh, a four, and a, a two-year-old, and and I wanted them to be close by. And and so we, from day one, it was always let's find a way to, to do this as family friendly as we can. You know, and, and and it's a it's a tough thing to balance in the in the the the, uh, the spirits industry. But um, to we we do we we do our team does an incredible job of of welcoming people and and offering an experience that uh that's fun and and uh, people keep coming back so it's it's a uh, like i said it's, it's a big honor for us to be able to 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 see all those new new friends and faces and have the the repeats coming back it's a we we don't take that lightly we we really work hard to to uh, uh to bring to bring people in the in the mix and and uh, love having them as part of the old smoky family it's got to be a bit of a a shock if you put 2009 and the great recession and what you were going through then versus now with the amount of people you employ and just the the success of the the brand overall yeah no it, it is I, I think that over the last 12 years we have had uh, we've had peaks and valleys and and uh, financially it's it's been you know i i uh, 
um, I remember the, that, that very first summer. I, I, was, I remember in early July of 2010, I, was, I, I, had, I had maxed out my, my credit card for our opening week, and, and I, I mean, we, I was all in. And, 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 and to say that uh, I was stressed out and, and worried, and you know, we, we had uh, a handful of employees at that point and, and obligations left and right financially for, for property and equipment and loans, and, and it, was, it was tough. And, uh, but when we opened, things, things went well from, from day one. You know, we, we, uh, we, we, were, we were really fortunate to see a lot of visitors from day one, and, and then you yeah, fast forward maybe uh, a few months later, two months later, you know, we were already running out of stuff. And, and, <laughs> we were, and, and then our, our next problem, uh, we, we started uh, getting calls from distributors that wanted to, to have the product in Florida or South Carolina or Georgia. And, and, and uh, so we started that. And again, we just, we didn't know, we, we knew zero about the industry. And, and so everything we, we did we were learning and, and doing it on the fly, and, and you know we're making making mistakes left and right, but but trying to, to learn from them and, and really uh, get better. And and so you, know, you you fast forward to to I remember the the, the next part where the, the next part of the story where I really lost sleep. We had uh, um, Walmart was gonna was gonna take our products into a, a I think stores in maybe 20 states. It was a it was a big number. And we hired people left and right, and we were just trying to, to assemble a team. And there was no fancy equipment that uh, that put these jars of moonshine together. It was all this, you know. It was it was yeah. it was a very laborious uh, uh, process. And so we um, um, we really um, we just we we worked hard. We got there, and and we finally we we had all these people, thirty or forty people that were coming in and, and making these products. And and then we realized. Mm-hmm we couldn't keep up with the orders and you know <laughs> big box stores are, are are notorious for for losing patience and and uh, cutting out products when you can't keep up and and we were i mean i, I think we were at best you know, five or six weeks behind I mean, it was really really it was looking bad mm. and I'm, I'm sitting there just praying that we can somehow do better because we're we're uh, i was afraid at that point that we were going to lose the the uh, the orders and then we had 30 or 40 employees that, that we would have to let go. And, and these were people, these weren't strangers to me. These were people that, uh, you know, they, they, were, they were probably related in some way. I probably went to high school with them or, or their, their family. You know, these are friends. These are neighbors. And, uh, and so, um, thank God, Walmart was patient with us. Mm-hmm. And, and we worked through that. And, uh, and then we, you know, we just, we, we had growing pains left and right from 2010 to 20. 14 and and then in 2014 we had uh, there was a little bit you know there were there was this rush there were a lot of different moonshine brands that were coming into the market and we we saw some contraction we we, we were really um, you know it, again as a business grows 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 and then all of a sudden you start seeing some some dip in sales it was uh, it was, we we had some uh, you know I, I don't want to call them dark days but they were they were they were definitely some tough we had some tough times and had to make some some difficult decisions along the way but the the uh over the last five years um our team and the leadership that that's in place has just i mean played their tails off and and really uh, through innovation and through the the expansion into the new markets and new stores and and the growth of the sales team and and really just being uh, being a, a a smart a well-run business you know we, we have been able to take a product that was great and now really turn it into a business that's great, and, and uh, credit certainly goes uh, to our team that that uh, that's working hard every day to do that. But but yeah, it's we, we, to say that we're we're in a, a much different place than 2010 is is, is an understatement. I, I think that while everything, our distilling, our retail business, our office, our you know, everything, everything was in 2,500 square feet. Now we. Uh, we occupy hundreds of thousands of square feet of, <laughs> of warehouses and production buildings, and we have uh, uh, a lot of employees that that are uh, um, that are that are working in the business and families that are that are living out of the business. It's it's a uh, yeah. It, it, other than 
other than my 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 wife and my children, it, it's uh, it's hard to be any prouder of of, uh, of Old Smoky. I, I'm uh, I'm I'm really I'm I'm glad to see what an impact it's it's been uh, in our community and and uh, our state. And and you know you talked about the legislative changes early in in 2009. I, I think that uh, we we um, I'm not one to, to, to toot my own horn, but, but I, I will say that, that our success and what, what you see as Old Smoky is, is certainly a, uh, a testament to the work that they did to, to create the new laws that, that opened up the, the industry in the state of Tennessee. Yeah. You're probably very um, much encouraging people right now who are going through supply side issues that it's like you can't overcome this. You just have to, uh, to wait. Cause of course we're having yeah. issues with that all over the country right now. Yeah. So has that, no, has I, that harmed you at all? Or is that, uh, we, we have seen, we've seen some difficulties here and there, but, but, uh, I, I think more in, uh, pricing, you know, we, we, we've seen some pricing pressures. Uh, it seems like everybody is, uh, is trying to, to take a little bit of price and, and, uh, that's, yeah, you know, it's it's a challenge we're facing right now as as a country on on the heels of of coming through the pandemic and and uh, uh, the, the the big influx of, of cash that that was put into the um, to the economy over the last couple of years. Um, it, it's yeah, you know, we, we've got challenges we face. I think from a business perspective, um, we we do see supply side issues. You know, whether it's the shipping and and it, but I, I think the reality is, you know, if you're in business, you better have thick skin. You know, you talk about those pioneers. <laughs> Those pioneers that came over in the in the 1700s into Tennessee, I, I think that our uh, it's just the same. You better have thick skin if you're going to get in business. But it's <laughs> it's hard. I, yeah. I have I have a, I have a, a running uh, idea or joke, you know, it, it, that I'm my phone when it rings. I, I know at least seems like once a day I'm going to get something that that somebody might think of as really really that's really awful. But it's you know in the reality of things, it's like well if that's as bad as it gets today. <laughs> yeah, I think you know, you're. Uh, we we yeah I think you're right. If, uh, if if there's anybody out there that's facing those similar challenges, we, we're all in the same boat. And we, you know, we, we'll we'll figure it out. So let's talk a little bit about whiskey and kind of your uh, history with whiskey. And also, we were you guys twice tried to get some uh, samples here for me, which I, I greatly appreciate. Unfortunately, supply side and unfortunately. Shipping services sometimes aren't 100% reliable, but I will do a tasting on those uh, on YouTube uh, once they come in. I'm in I'm in Greenville pretty up. I'm in Greenville every now and then, so I will make a point of of uh, bringing you. Some <laughs> All right, I'll hold <laughs> you, you to that. <laughs> Um, one of the things that I do have here, though, was a, a bottle that I got while I was in Nashville for your 10th anniversary when you did the um, 153 proof. And I know I'm saying yes. 153 proof moonshine, and and there are people going, how do you even taste that? I mean, is it it's it's got to be like lighter fluid that it's uh, so so powerful uh, to to drink. But I laugh because both you and and Johnny both said very drinkable. That at yeah. 153 proof, this is very drinkable. So I'm going to demonstrate. <laughs> yeah. That's good. So talk a little bit about uh, 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 about your mash bills, and do you um, are you making corn moonshine, or are you making moonshine that's a blend of different grains? We both. We so we we have uh, we have uh, products that are are all corn, and then we we've done some um, some sugar wash, some some uh, uh, mash bills that that include sugar and corn. And uh, as as we've explored that, we, we've got the corn whiskey, um, the the one fifty three that, that you're trying there, the blue flame, and uh, and then we've we've got uh, a, a, a few um, a few formulas that we're working on. Um, I, I'll be excited to to tell you about uh, uh, soon. That uh, that we're, we're we're hoping to push out, and and these are there's there's I think the the history of moonshine has has been such that. Um, you know, in, in the early part of, late, let's say, the late 1800s in, in the Smoky Mountains, there was access to corn because corn was being grown in the mountains. But sugar was, you know, that, that, that was not a commodity that, that was easily accessible. And, and so um, as, as ingredients or the availability of ingredients 
changed and, and opened up. You saw a move towards uh, products that, that were sugar-based, and, and so our, um, our products honor a lot of those, those different uh, pieces that were, were developed along the way. And, and uh, I am, I'm partial to the corn whiskey. It, it, I just, I, I think that it's, uh, and maybe it's, it's, uh, maybe it's part of the, the you know, that, uh, what, what I consider to be the, the best representation of, uh, of who we are as a people and, and, and what, uh, what our, our whiskey heritage really, you know, where, where that really came from in the mountains. But uh, there, there's a place for all of it, and, and I, I think that the uh, when we were celebrating the the, uh, the 10 year anniversary, I, I think that to put that uh, that product on the shelf at 153 proof, it, it was a uh, it was an effort to to show that you could put something out there that uh, while it, it it certainly is uh, um, it's it is a very high proof product, it, it's you know, I, I think drinkable. It, it sounds like a pretty generic and and uh, uh, vanilla term in some ways, but but when you try it, it's not what you would expect. I, mm -hmm. I think that uh, sometimes when when people um, when when they when they think about drinking 153 proof anything, it's it's you're, you're right. You think it's going to set your hair on fire. <laughs> well, and and and, 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 you, and you're not thinking that there's going to be a lot of flavor there. It's more about getting the the bang out of the alcohol. But the yeah. thing that I notice in in drinking it. It, it has a very strong corn note on the nose, but once you yeah. go in and you put it on the palate, uh, on the nose also, don't take a big waft of it because <laughs> it will burn your nose hairs. But um, when you put it on your palate, the only thing that really tells me this is high proof is that there is kind of like a, uh, it, it's almost like it evaporates towards the end when it's uh when it's on your palate but on the front end uh you're you're getting like i get the the corn note yes i get some of the herbally rye in there but i also get like a, a lemon uh citrus kind of a flavor out of it it's like the their flavors there um and no i wasn't screaming when i first put it on my tongue but i also didn't take a mouthful of it uh yeah. i got you know, yeah just enough of it to uh you know to be able to taste it and get an idea of of what it's like and so and and what i love about it is actually on the finish it's very very clean i mean it's yeah. uh, you would think something like that is going to leave a very heavy note of something negative on your on your tongue but it doesn't it's just very clean yeah it, it's it's fun to uh to be able to to explore products like that 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 may be a uh uh, a challenge just just on 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 the face but uh, but uh, you're, you're right it's it's a uh, it's a product that it surprises you yeah I think in 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 the uh, um, the way you process the 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 liquid and, and and really you know how how it leaves you it's it's not a um, it's not it's not what you'd think it would be yeah and I think a lot I think a lot of times these uh, moonshiners think that they're making high proof stuff because it has a really heavy alcohol taste to it. And so they just assume that because it has a heavy alcohol flavor to it, that it's got to be high proof and, and right. couldn't be. Whereas this doesn't have an alcohol flavor to it really at all. And yet right. it's 153 proof. Yeah. I, I think a lot of it's got to do with just, you know, how, how, uh, uh a lot of the distillers, um, we're, we're managing their, their, uh, heads and tails and, and what, uh, what was, you know, what, what was coming off that still was, uh, was, uh, you know, not always managed well. And, and I think that that's, that's one of the pieces of, of where we are with, with our products now is, is with, uh, uh, a little bit more sophistication in the process of how we make our, our, our whiskey. It's, you know, we, when we talk about moonshine and, and whether it's, you know, the, the same as what, uh, yeah, maybe my my great great granddad might have made in in uh, in the mountains versus what we do today. I, I think that the, the reality is it, it is very much the same. It's just process, consistency, and and being able to to manage your product in in a way that you know what what the consumer is getting at the end of the day. So, it's um, that that one fifty three. I don't know if you had the blue flame while you were in town. I, but the blue flame little little cup of it. Yeah, uh, that uh, that was a my my dad would. Uh, I, I remember. As a kid, he would always uh, he he would uh, always be 
pouring a little into a spoon and, and burning whatever <laughs> whatever he brought. He wanted and he, he wanted to know if that the flame was burning blue and and you know it, 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 he was certainly not uh, he was not uh, a trained chemist so I'm not sure that it meant anything scientific. <laughs> In his mind, it was a uh, it was a good test as to to you know what what the flavor and, and quality of that that product was and and so to honor that we we rolled out the the blue flame moonshine which is uh, it's in a it's in a, a glass jar and the the glass is blue the liquid is clear okay and and it's a uh, uh, it's a product that uh, it's sold I think it's sold at one twenty eight and and um, it's it's a, a sugar and corn uh, mash that uh, it really it, it's again it's you know if, if you think the one the, the the product that you just tried is is approachable and, and drinkable that one you know you knock it down uh, 20, 20 points or so it's it really it's it's my favorite of our of our uh, uh, clear products and uh, it, it's uh, it's one that that I'm personally most proud of and, and a lot of it I think is probably just my association with uh, my dad and the story there but but uh, it's it's a uh, it's a pretty good lineup of of clear spirits for sure yeah when you go into any of the old smokies it's almost a little bit of entertainment along with your pouring of your samples when you go in and um we uh, when i was doing the tasting though i wanted to taste your blended whiskey because you do have a you do have a blended whiskey but um is that something that you've basically just kind of held to add flavors to and and you offer it but it's not really something that you focus on too much yeah you know our uh, our whiskey offering has evolved over the years and and that was that was something that uh, like you said we we with our flavored whiskeys it, it was an important part of that that process and uh we're um it's not a focus the blended whiskey and and so i i think that it's probably I, i'm not even um i i should know this i don't even know if it's on the shelves right now but it's <laughs> i haven't I think, seen it so yeah. yeah i i could maybe i could maybe uh wrangle up a bottle for <laughs> but I, I think that it's uh that was you know as we have as we've grown up and evolved i think our our product lineup certainly has changed and in the blended whiskey uh, as an offering as, by itself, um, that that uh, that's one of those things that that I think we've we've also kind of we've we've grown past. Um, it's there's a place for it, and and uh, you you might still see it, but it, it's uh, we we really now are are becoming much more focused on um, our uh, our efforts behind the the James OMB, the the bourbon, and and then also the we we do make a and sell a Tennessee whiskey that uh, that sold as an old smoky Tennessee whiskey and, and, you know, the different, the different varieties that you'll see there, but it, it's, uh, we, we've, uh, yeah, we started with just clear corn whiskey and, and then the, all the flavors evolved and then the whiskeys, the flavored whiskeys. And, and, and now, you know, this is something I am a, um, I'm, I'm one, like I said, I, I'm, I'm not a, a, a flavored flavor kind of guy. I like the, I like, uh, I like, uh, my bourbon neat. I'm not a, a cocktail drinker. And, and so, uh, now as as we've uh, been able to you know it's it's a tough business to jump in if you think you want to you want to get into the the bourbon business um uh, yeah if, if you're gonna do it and, and lay down product and and you you're gonna wait four years at least if you know it, it's it's just i i think that the uh, the investment that's required is uh is so significant that uh, it's tough you know it's it's tough for any craft whiskey to exist or or to to be rolled out without without that whiskey being sourced at, at some point. And I think that, you know, the, the, as our business has evolved, you know, we've been able to lay down whiskey and, and create our own program, but, but it, it's a, uh, it's a challenge. And, and so, um, it just, just like the, the going from the blended whiskey to now having the, the, uh, the James OMB or even the, I think the, the, the bourbon that, uh, that you described, I, I'd call it a baby bourbon, maybe that, that was, uh, just the, one of those small barrels that, that we were experimenting with. Those are, those are all, you know, parts of that evolution. And, and, uh, um, yeah, I, it's, I, again, you get back to, you know, what, what, what people want. You, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a label reader. I like to know where, where things came from. And yeah. I like to, to see, you know, where, who was making it? Was it, was it sourced? Was it, uh, was this blended? And, yeah, there are reasons behind all of that, and, and there are some incredible um, there are some incredible products out there that, that are that are fully sourced and blended, and and so uh, we're 
you know, we've been part of that process and, and uh, proud to, to be able to, to put out our own stuff, though, now. Um, but the blended whiskey, it, it had its place. But yeah. it's, it's kind of, it's, it's shelf space is, is, uh, is getting Dwindling. smaller. Yeah. <laughs> so the, uh, let's talk about the James OMB because as I was reading it, uh, on the label, it says Tennessee bourbon whiskey. And whenever I see the name Tennessee, the first thing that's going to pop into my mind is the Lincoln County process. And right. it's interesting to note that George Dickel recently came out with a bourbon that is that does go through the Lincoln County process, kind of their way of saying, hey, look, you know, you it is bourbon, and we're right. just putting it through that extra um, that extra step. Is the James Owen B a bourbon, or is it a Tennessee whiskey, or or I should say, is it a uh, bourbon that goes through the Lincoln County yeah. process? It has, yeah, okay, it, it has. And I think that uh, you know, it, it's it's funny. My uh, my preference, uh, I, I have. Uh, um, there are there are um, critics uh, of the Lincoln County process, and and uh, and then there are those that celebrate it, and and so I am uh, um, I'm of of the mind that there's there's space for 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 both of those. Uh, we we uh, we actually we do both. I, I think that the uh, in some of the blending that uh, that, that that we do, um, you'll you'll see that that there are products that uh, that have been. Um, through the the Lincoln County process and some that haven't, but that that product has uh, the product that you you talked about uh, again in in Nashville that uh, Uncle Johnny let you try that that was that was not uh, charcoal filtered and so uh, um, it, it is ours is uh, that one the James One B it's a, a, everything that we've used is at least four years old uh, most of it's uh, uh, over five years old and and uh, you know it, it is a uh, a heavy corn product with with uh, uh, the rye and barley, but it, it is, uh, it, it is, uh, I, I, I would say, uh, 100%, uh, at, at least to date, it has been charcoal filtered. Okay. And it's, yeah. and it's partially, uh, your spirit and some sourced spirit. Yeah, we have, we have sourced, uh, sourced whiskey that, uh, that, that has been part of that, uh, that development. And, uh, and as I said earlier, we've, we've laid down whiskey for a while. So it's, it's a, uh, you know, it, it, and and I think that uh, there there was a time where where it, it was kind of an ugly uh, ugly term to say that something was sourced. But the reality is, if if you're gonna if you're gonna make a product and and, uh, and if you're gonna make it well and and consistent and be able to offer it to the market, it, it's gonna happen. I mean, there, there's not a I I, I can't. Uh, um, you might be able to tell me some, but I I can't tell you any any new bourbon brands that uh, that have been created uh, over the last ten years or so that that have just you know popped up without just started without, without. yeah course. i mean a lot of them there are some uh, uh you know some of the smaller operations that have held out but you're right there's an expense to yeah. sitting there for four years waiting for your spirits and and so a lot of them will either start out with vodka and gin and they can sell right. the vodka and gin they might make a moonshine and uh and that was something that when i was talking to johnny you know it was really interesting that uh, I said, why didn't you guys do more whiskey? And, and he said, well, you know, we make the moonshine. We sell the moonshine. We don't have to store the moonshine. We don't have to go through all these extra processes. And if you're selling enough moonshine, then, you know, it's not a compelling reason to jump straight in and go through that extra process of having warehouses and, you know, dealing with the taxes and all the other stuff that you have to deal with. I, I would have loved would have loved to started with a, a whiskey product and, and <laughs> I think as a, as a, as a fan, but, but the reality was I would have gone broke and I couldn't afford to, I mean, it yeah. wasn't, I just, I, we, we didn't have the luxury and, and, uh, I, I couldn't, I, I mean, I, I couldn't have, I couldn't have afforded to, to source one barrel of, of, of aged whiskey yeah. in 20. So for us, it was, it was not a, uh, it wasn't even on our radar to be honest with you. I, I think that we, 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 uh, we made products that uh, that, that were um, consistent with with uh, our heritage in the mountains, and and that was fortunately it was unaged product. Yeah, <laughs> that was, was that was it, and that's where we started. And and I think since then, you know, we've been able to celebrate the other part of, of Tennessee's history and in, in spirits with the, with the aged uh, the aged stuff. But it, it's it is it's tough, and and uh, my my hats off to everybody out in the the industry that's that's doing it, you know, and, and trying to 
to uh, to to grow brands that uh, that require aged product because it is it is a uh, it's a it's a tough hill to climb. Absolutely. So, what would you say the availability is on the James OMB product? Is it uh, going to be everywhere Old Smoky is at, or is it kind of uh, more uh, regional? Yeah. Or it's it's at this point it's it's more regional. We, we're we're um, we're tr- we're trying to to just keep up. It, it's uh, it has sold really well, and and uh, I, I think that uh, um, you know it, it, it's. Again, another challenge of of, uh, of an aged product is you can't just you can't just keep ramping it up. You know, it's yeah. not it's not. It, so I, I think that uh, we we're facing some some uh, challenges there, but uh, at least in the near term, it's it's certainly um, going to be more uh, regional or, or local in in its availability. Yeah, when you think about now the legacy that you're you've developed. And it it seems like when we talk about legacy, we're talking about hundred year legacy or whatever. But I mean, really, the Tennessee distilling era of uh, of growth here in the last you know twelve to fourteen years, uh, it's amazing to see all that has gone on. And then if you go to Gatlinburg now, you see a lot of places that are doing moonshine. Right. Uh, I went into King's Distillery, and uh, you know yeah. Justin King was there at yeah. Old Smoky at uh, at one point. So, I mean, how does it feel for you now, seeing where the industry is and uh, and the growth at this point overall, even beyond Old Smoky? Yeah, I'm super proud of it. You know, I, I think that uh, the uh, the market is uh, is such that uh, I, I feel like you, it, it's easy to be. To be uh, protective and, and feel like you know the, the competition is going to be a, a real a real negative for us and and I, I think but the the reality is and, and what I've seen and, and I think this is just maybe uh, uh, me evolving and maturing as, as a as a person and as a as a business owner but uh, to see the industry thrive to see more jobs created to see more people. Uh, be able to to build businesses that that feed their families. It, it's and to celebrate a, a a part of the culture here in in the state. I, I I'm not sure that uh, uh, there there can be much better than than creating opportunity and and uh, and success for not not only for businesses but you know that leads to revenue and jobs. So it, it's I think the impact has has been terrific and uh, I, I I'm excited to see other distilleries do well with with their products and and you know whether that's in in Gatlinburg or Sevier County where 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 we're from or or you know many many other places across the state there's some terrific things that are happening in the spirits industry in the state of Tennessee and and uh, I'm proud that we're we're part of that and certainly that we were you know, we were kind of first to the game under this uh, the, under the new laws that that opened that up 12 years ago and and uh, what a what a what a great thing for for the state of Tennessee to see to see the evolution and and the growth in an, in an industry that that really like you say it was limited to uh, to three distilleries prior to 2010 and and now we're you know we're 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 one of many so I it, it's it's great to see it you know in, in the story just even with Justin Justin uh, was uh, was one of our our first uh, team members at Old Smoky and. Uh, before that, he was he was a good family friend and is and and uh, uh, a, a a cousin. I, I I joke it's it's you know, we were, if you're if you're from one of you know the the let's call it the 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 five or ten families that were in Sevier County in in the the early uh, late 1800s early 1900s you're you're related. <laughs> My kids get a kick out of uh, how how many cousins I have, and and so uh, and how many cousins they have now. To, so it's it's, uh, but it, it, I love that. I love that Justin's done well, and and uh, he's he's really making a, a good impact in the in the uh, in the industry. And, and we're seeing that. You know, we've got people that have worked at Old Smoky that uh, that are are now employed in in a lot of places across the state and and uh, doing well within within the industry. Yeah. Well, Joe. I really appreciate you taking the time. I've been, uh, ever since I talked to Johnny, I've been like, I would love to get Joe on the show to kind of give us those early days. And, and because we now think of old Smokey, we see it on the shelves everywhere and you just uh, kind of take for granted that it's there and you don't really think about all the struggles that it took to, to get through that. And that really, even though it seems like it's been there for a long time, it, these, this is still a very young industry 
in Tennessee. So uh, it's it's fun to hear the stories, and I, I really appreciate you sharing them. No, it, it's it's my great pleasure, and and uh, proud that, uh, that that our brand now is is a part of part of this uh, great podcast. So thank you. Oh, thank you.